Little image and then I do operate. So the type of thing we had. So you know it's not practical saying that there is, I mean, there are no CT films and transferring all the patients you get, it's not practical because you know, the other centers, the bigger centers, they have, you know, double the work. They have so many patients, or the caseload is very high. And uh, so they don't have times, they don't have capacity, they don't have facilities to, you know, to look after other private patients also. So it's not practical. I mean, you can selectively send, but it's not practical. So you have to find your own solution. And next comes the quality of the images. For example, uh, the CT machine I had in particular, I think it was an eight slice CT scan. So, I mean, you can't expect CT angiograms of, you know, a greater quality from that machine. So, you know, where I worked before, I worked at Queen Square, and straight away I came to Batiklo where there were, you know, high fi stuff and, uh, you know, everything is, you know, high tech. Then I suddenly came to Batiklo and uh, found that uh, this is the type of quality CTO and children we have. You know, you can imagine my feelings, but that's life, you had to face it. And I was told that most of the time CT angiograms becomes negative, but fortunately or unfortunately for me, after I went there, most of the CT angiograms became positive. So I had no choice. Right, so then lack of instruments and equipment. This is again, you know, quite a considerable problem we are having at the moment, right? You know, for example, uh, we didn't have medical screws for uh, spine fixation. When I was in Batiklo, we didn't have, you know, cages for this ACDF. We didn't have enough aneurysm clips. We didn't have cranioplasty mesh. And uh, for example, currently also, uh, I'm having, you know, uh, a basic microscope, uh, which is, you know, less maneuverable and it doesn't focus most of the times. And it's very heavy, difficult to, you know, tackle, difficult to maneuver. I mean, we have a lot of problems, but it doesn't mean that you had to stop your all the procedures. You had to do it. That's life. Okay. Then it comes to the lack of ICU beds. Again, a universal problem. So most of the times the neurosurgical procedure is being postponed due to lack of ICU beds. Especially this is this becomes a problem for a, you know an emergency in an emergency situation because peripheral hospitals they send the patient intubated. And uh, you do the CT and you find acute SDH and uh, you need an ICU bed for surgery after the surgery. So if you don't have ICU beds, what are you going to do? It's a very difficult situation because you know in uh, most of our hospitals, the ICU capacity is limited. When I worked in Batiklo, they had just one ICU, but how many surgeons they had? And that ICU only having five or six beds maximum. Today also in Ratnapura, we have one a &E ICU for our patients having a capacity of five beds. So where are you going to put these patients? It's a dilemma, right? Then lack of trained staff in the theaters, in the wards, in the ICUs, right? So in the theaters also, the nursing officers are not trained sometimes. In the wards, the nursing officers are not trained to manage neurosurgical patients. For example, some people, they don't know how to manage an EVD there. They don't know how to manage lumbar drains. In the ICU, most of the time, the ICU is run by, you know, inexperienced medical officers, maybe released house officers. So they don't know to manage complex neurosurgical cases. But, you know, these things we can, you know, uh, we can, we have answers for, we can train them. It takes time. There is a learning curve, but, you know, we have solutions for this. It's not a big issue. Right, then difficulties in transferring patients. 
practically difficult most of the times. Even though you have protocols, theoretically, yes, you can transfer. But practically, when it comes to practice, you know it's difficult. It's difficult. Right. And especially when you work in the periphery, you see that the majority of the population, they are, have very low income, they have low educational level, they have lack of transport, less access to hospitals, less facilities in the healthcare sectors. And not only that, you have to, you know, you have to tackle with their misbeliefs and misconceptions. For example, I'll, I'll, I'll show you in the next few case scenarios that you have to do neurosurgery plus, you know, uh, convince people for surgery, change their attitudes, change their misconceptions, misbelief. It's not only neurosurgery you have to concentrate on. You know, it's a holistic approach. For example, when I work in Eastern province, you know, most of the people are very poor. If you say to them, see here, you have got a tumor in your brain. You won't say tumor, you say a lump in the brain. Some people would say, okay, we, I have got a tumor, okay. <clears throat> Let's go and do some native treatment. Some people would say, okay, I have got a lump. Uh, doctor, do you have any other method other than surgery to treat this? Can I go for native treatment? Because you know, my grandmother's somebody died after the operation of a brain tuber. It's my friend's friend underwent a spinal surgery and thereafter he was crippled, he was bedridden. So I don't want to be, you know, get, get bedridden. I want to, I don't want to get paralyzed, right? I don't want to die after brain surgery. That's the, you know, that's the, you know, uh, misconception. That's the attitude they have. They don't have trust in you. They don't have trust in your surgery. You know, in contrast to the uh, patients coming to you in National Hospital of Neurology and Neurosurgery in Queen's Square, London, they have Google it everything. So sometimes you feel that uh, the patient knows better than you, but here they don't know anything. If you say, okay, it's brain surgery, you have 5% chance of infection and 3% chance of CSF leak. You say water leaking through your spinal cord or through the brain membranes, then they will say, okay, doctor, we have 3% chance of that. Okay, let's go and do the uh, some native treatment like that it's very difficult right so i mean lots of lots of things to talk on but i think you know i will just summarize the things an inadequate theater time obviously i think in some centers where i work specifically the theater time is not adequate i mean we can't point fingers at anyone we can't you know blame anesthetists because they don't have manpower they have limited resources they don't have medical officers so they can't, you know, give us an adequate theater time. There are a lot of surgeons, but we don't have adequate time. So for example, I'm for the routine procedures, I just had two days per week when I was in particular. And here, three days per week from only from eight to two. But still we are doing, you know, two major procedures and sometimes one minor procedure, co-intermediate procedure. But that's how it goes. So what do we do? Do we practice neurosurgery? Some people might ask, are you practicing neurosurgery with these resources? Of course, yes, we do. So let's see how we, you know, overcome these obstacles and uh, how do we practice every day? I'll show you, I'll go through some of the uh, case scenarios for you. Uh, but uh, I want to stress that this is, you know, uh, maybe two to three percent of my work. And all these cases are being related to the topic. So these cases may not be the best cases of my team, but these cases have a special significance and uh, they are related to the topic. And that's why I'm uh, going, taking you through these uh, case scenarios. And also, uh, I just wanted to say that uh, 
I was never expecting, you know, uh, to present uh, a thing like this. So, you know, I was not collecting my data or any images, you know, in a uh, organized way. So it was really haphazard. So most of the time I don't have uh, enough uh, photographs or videos to show you because uh, uh, the microscope I'm having doesn't have, uh, you know, the screen and doesn't have the video uh, recording facility. In particular also, I had a better microscope, but the recording function was not working. So what we do is we uh, have a viber group, you know, uh, in our neurosurgical unit. When a patient comes to us, they uh, put it to us, they put it in the viber group and uh, so the pre off and post off, you know, the image has been put there. So I just gathered a few photos from there uh, because I was using an iPhone before and unfortunately I changed to uh, an Android phone and unfortunately I couldn't, you know, back up the vibe. So I lost all my uh, important stuff there. So anyway, uh, let's see whether we can get uh, an idea of it. This is my first case to show you. Uh, it's a 34 years old male presented with headache, altered behavior, anosmia, and visual field defect. Her main problem was altered behavior, and that's why she presented. There was we did the CT. There was a giant, uh, you know, this uh, the anterior skull based tube, and the relatives were not willing for surgery, and they wanted to go for native treatment, and. Not only that, they were not happy to go outside from the city for MRI scan because, you know, we didn't have MRI at particular. So either we had to get it from the private sector, from Colombo or Candy, or we had to send the patient to uh, the government sector in Candy to get the MRI. But they were not willing to go outside the city. So this is the tumor they presented with. So what am I supposed to do? I can't force them to, uh, I mean, get transferred to a different hospital to get an MRI done. And what I did was, I explained to them, so you have got a, you know, a big tumor. And uh, these patients were very anxious. It's a big tumor. And, uh, you know, as I told you earlier, the patient being admitted to a different ward because we didn't have a separate neurosurgical unit. And you know, when you admit to a different unit, some people give opinions, especially the, the next door, the next bed patients, they were giving opinions. See, you have got a large tumor, you will definitely die. Like, I mean, there were so many, you know, so many uh, other problems they had. But we operated on her. This is the pre-op without an MRI. So I was anticipating the uh, anterior cerebral vessels uh, either, you know, uh, adhere to the tumor or in case by the tumor. So it happened. So I could uh, find the anterior cerebral vessels very well and I safe preserved them nicely. I had a photo and actually, uh, I had a few uh, uh, recorded uh, videos from for this one, but unfortunately I had lost it. So this is the post-op. She was absolutely fine after the surgery and her visual field effects uh, improved, uh, but she developed a CSF leak later uh, at around post-operative day five. And I had to do a facial out of uh, grafting to her and she was absolutely fine after that. No other complications. Uh, I'll show you the, the video of her. This is her. So she was uh, initially uh, very, very aggressive, but she became very funny and she was very happy finally. So this is her. Okay. Next case, a similar case. 
62 years old female, again coming with headache and personality changes. And she also had visual field defect. And this was very recently, uh, maybe around three months back in Ratnapura. So she had this COVID effect. COVID effect means, you know, when the second wave of COVID hits Sri Lanka, I mean, uh, Colombo was more vulnerable. So most of the people, most of the patients from Ratnapura, they were very uh, reluctant to go out of the city, especially to Colombo to get an MRI scan done. So I explained to her, you need an MRI, but she was not willing to go out. So I had to operate on her without an MRI because she had severe headache and she had deteriorating visual field defects. We did the surgery, no complications. This is the pre-op, you see, the similar type of uh, brain tumor, the similar type of uh, tumor. This is the pre-op, this is the post-op. And uh, this is her. She had no problems whatsoever, absolutely fine. Another case, after operating the previous case, I got a similar case one week after. Again, 65 year old male, she's hypertensive and had ischemic heart disease. She had behavioral change and I mean, severe headaches, which were uh, not uh, responding to uh, the painkillers. And she was very, very anxious. Again, she had the same problem. She was not willing to go outside because she had a lot of social issues. Uh, she was alone, she didn't have any family support, and she didn't want to go out. But she was happy to get the surgery done by us. She had faith in us. So we, she wanted to get the surgery, but she did not want to go outside. So this is the problem I had, you know, due to the COVID. People were reluctant to go out of the city. So MRI was not uh, practicable during this type of uh, situations. So this is the pre-op. You can see the similar type of tumor, olfactory grew. This was actually a bit difficult than the other cases. This is the postdoc. This is her. Can you see she was very anxious? So it was the subfrontal approach for all three, uh, three patients we used. But you can see this is after three months. Actually, her wound is absolutely fine. Wound is healed, but she had a small, you know, uh, stitch coming out. So we had to remove it after giving some local anesthesia. So even though it's a small, you know, very small wound, she wanted the big wound dressing. That much, she was very, she was anxious. Okay, another case of tackling the relatives. A 37-year-old female, a mother of seven children, presented with uh, seizures and change in behavior and social issues. Her family was about to disrupt. So we did the CT, and CT showed a large lesion. Here the lesion. And again, the family was not willing for surgery, especially her husband. She, he did not want her to have the surgery. So they left against medical advice and saying that we are going for an anti treatment. And after two months, as I felt, as I thought, she presented with the low GCS to the emergency treatment unit, GCS of seven. So she was intubated and we asked the relatives, what do you want to do now? Do you still want to go for any other treatment? They said, no, we are happy for surgery. And she was operated the following day. Of course, she was unstable with the low GCS, so she was in ICU. So uh, rather than going for an MRI or any other investigation, I planned for surgery straight away. She had ptosis, right side this ptosis before the surgery. And uh, she had persistent ptosis even after the surgery, but it was gradually improved with time. 
This is the tumor, very hard, solid tumor, very firm. You would rather say hard. It's very extremely calcified. And it's attached to and uh, compressing the third nerve also. I thought it was a tentorial meningioma. Uh, but I'm still not sure about it. It was a meningioma, it was a fibrous meningioma. And this is the post of CT. I had a video of her, but unfortunately I missed it. And uh, she, get, she got a post-operative CSF leak, which we, uh, uh, which we uh, reconstructed the dura with the fascia lata graft. This is her, this is a photo of her. After the surgery, she became absolutely fine. Her behavioral change absolutely reversed. She was very happy and I think I was very satisfied that uh, we, uh, we were able to save her family, which was about to disrupt. And my released house officer did a very good job in convincing her. Because the problem with, you know, these people, they speak Tamil and I'm Sinhalese, so I don't know much Tamil, so I had that language very also. So whenever I communicate with them, I communicate through my medical officers. I mean, all three were Tamil. But the problem is when we, you know, when you communicate through some people, you, you communicate with someone, you communicate through someone else, sometimes you know what you want to tell will not be communicated as it is. Uh, so that was one, another disadvantage. I, I wouldn't say disadvantage, another a drawback, right? Another one, 24 years old, female, she presented with seizures and right-sided lower limb weakness. Surgery planned in another center and she didn't turn up on that day because of fear for surgery. And she came to us because she was from close by. All these cases were done in Batiklo. And uh, these cases were done in Batiklo. Uh, she was from Arugambe, close by. So she came to me and I had to convince her that uh, the chances of her dying are very low. And we operated on her. She had a right-sided weakness, a large parasagittal meningioma. We had to tackle with the sinus. This is the post-operative CT. She was absolutely fine. And this is her video. She was young, she was unmarried, she was anxious, and she was absolutely fine. Okay, the most scary day in my neurosurgical life, which I can never forget. 42 years old fever, change in behavior was her main problem for the, uh, the family but she had seizures which was not controlled with medication and left-sided body weakness. She was really, really anxious. This is what she got. See the tumor? See the, uh, the carotids? Definitely the carotids are encased by the tumor, the middle cerebral arteries encased by the tumor. So after seeing this, uh, see this MRI, I said to her, I think you go, you better go and uh, consult another surgeon, maybe in, uh, you know, in a center with uh, better facilities. But she was reluctant to go there. I don't know whether she has gone there, but according to her husband, she has gone there and uh, she was uh, reluctant to get it done by someone else, especially uh, away from her village, away from her home. So what she told me was, this is my village, even though I die, I want to die here. So I have faith on you, so please operate on me. That's what she said. Then, you know, I was actually trying to convince her. She was coming to see me so many times. I said, see, this is a difficult tumor. We have got very limited resources. So, you know, you can die on the table. We can damage the carotid artery. But I don't know, maybe because of, uh, you know, psychological abnormality. She was, I mean, 
she was uh, uh, I would say clueless. She was uh, really different. Uh, she was not listening to us. And all the relatives, the husband, they requested us to do the surgery. Okay. So then I said, okay, I'll do the surgery. So let's pick the date. And uh, that was during the, uh, the, the first wave of COVID. I think this was in January or February, as I can remember. So I did the surgery. And you know, my heart was pounding when I started the surgery. I knew what's going to happen. I knew that when there is a high chance, you know, I could damage the carotids. So we were ready with the aneurysm clips and we were ready with the sutures if something happens. So I know this is not an, ed not an educational webinar. So this is just an informative webinar, but I just wanted to show you that, you know, I was trying to, you know, follow, I mean, all the correct techniques. The tumor, I recalculated the tumor capsule, incised, right, debulked it, and then I identified the MCA branches and followed them proximally to establish a deception plane. And the tumor was very, very, very firm extremely firm, extremely difficult to remove. I used the CUSA, but it was not successful. With the diatom, you can't do that. So I tried to use the fine, uh, the sharp dissection with the scissors and removed in a very piecemeal fashion. I tried to uh, recognize an arachnoid plane, but it was a very thin and obliterated. So since the tumor was too adherent, I left a small sheet of tumor on the vessels, on the middle cerebral vessels. And then finally, I could identify the, the preparatory artery, the paraclinoid segment, the optic nerves and the third nerve. And then what I did, I, I realized that the artery is very thinned out, the very thinned out, very much compressed of the tumor. And there was some bleeding. So I tried to coagulate that bleeding with the diatomy. And suddenly, I found I have made a tear in the carotid artery, which was, I mean, <clears throat> very accidental, and I didn't expect that. And since the arterial wall is very thin, there was, you know, sudden gush of blood, like opening a tap. So you can imagine a bleeding from the carotid artery. So I was very, very upset, and I was very, very, you know, this is, I mean, very frustrated at that time. So, because I knew that, I knew what was going to happen, see. So I was telling to myself, see, this is what happened, I told, right? So see what we are going to do now. My medical officer was shocked and the anesthetist was shocked. I mean, you see like a, you know, like a tap, the blood was coming out at rapid speed. Anyway, I was able to apply two clips and get the control of the artery. And we already had uh, brought uh, 10 no uh, proline from the eye theater. So I was luckily able to suture the tear and control the bleeding. So my heart was in mouth that, that day. So obviously she had a swelling in the brain immediately, she had a, you know, post op swelling as well. We paralyzed and intubated her. So we kept her on paralysis for 48 hours. And I went to my room that day and I told my wife, see, I think I have killed this patient, right? And I said, I don't know why she wants to die on my hands, right? I was really upset at, on that day, but fortunately on, fifth post-operative day, she was gradually uh, becoming better and better. And this is her. This is, I think, uh, sixth post-operative day. And that, I mean, this case, I will never forget in my life. Okay. Another case, handling difficult cases with minimal resources. This is a 43-year-old mother with 10 children, 10 children. She was the only breadwinner. She's widowed and she had three children less than five years. She presented with rapid loss of vision and ptosis. Again, she was not happy to go out of city. I mean, obviously in her case, 
she had valid reasons for that. She had 10 children and three children uh, less than five years. She was the sole breadwinner. So she was Tamil, she didn't know the language. So obviously she did not want to go outside the city. What has she got? What, what, she, what she got was, I don't know whether you can see or you can appreciate here. She got uh, probably a cavernous sinus meningioma, a cavernous sinus lesion, probably a cavernous sinus meningioma. This is the tumor. So I knew this was going to be a very tough one. So again, I'm just giving you these, uh, the steps I followed to tell you that I was trying to follow the absolute correct technique. I did the front orbital, orbital cytomatic osteotomy, I built the sphenoid bridge, I identified and dissected the meningo orbital band, did an anticlinodectomy, unroofed the optic nerve, explored the cavernous sinus to the Parkinson's triangle, and identified the sixth nerve and I resected tumor. There was heavy bleeding, but I was able to control that. And this is her. This is the pre-op, you can see the ptosis, right? Her vision was very much deteriorating. This is for stop day one. And her vision was already got better. And we did the uh, visual fields after that, and she got almost 90% of her vision back. Very satisfying surgery. Another case, difficult case. Again, did with the CT, no MRI. Meningioma, a tough one. And video four. So there she is. Absolutely fine. Right. Okay. Another case. This is actually a glioma. And you may be wondering why I am showing this to you. We have done so many gliomas. I mean, I'm not showing you any of the straightforward cases we did. So a lot of gliomas we have done. But uh, this one we did without an MRI. So I usually don't operate gliomas without an MRI. But this patient, a young patient from Ratnapura, actually from Balangod, she was really anxious. And uh, again, because of the COVID, she did, did not want to go out. She did not want to go out of the city. I don't know. I mean. It's, it's, it's it actually as a neurosurgeon, it was, I mean, a really difficult situation for me because these patients were not happy to go outside, even for an MRI. So I had to operate on her without the MRI. And you know, we don't have the navigators in uh, Batiklo or in Ratapura. Most of the centers, we don't have a navigator. So you, without, you do a glioma without navigators, so you had to be spot on with your craniometric points. So this is the pre-op. So I explained her, usually I'm not doing surgeries without an MRI, but if you are, since you are requesting it, I'm going ahead, but you know, these are the possibilities. These are the complications, you know, and you need to have radiotherapy later. So, but she agreed, she accepted that. So this is the first one and only one I have done without an MRI. So this is the uh, first resection. Uh, I, uh, I, I felt that uh, the resection was not very adequate, so I kept, uh, usually I don't do contrastitis within the first 48 hours of a patient after glioma, but this one I thoroughly felt that I haven't resected completely. So you can obviously see there is a residual, so I kept her. I did the second resection again, and we did the MRI for stop. Now she was happy to go for an MRI because she was happy. Uh, and she didn't get any, you know, uh, complications. And her vision was also getting better and better. So we had a minimal residual, maybe less than 10%, and we sent her for uh, uh, radiotherapy. So this is her. Uh, let me show you that again. So she didn't have any uh, residual. She didn't have any, you know, complications. Right. This one. Cerebral point and angle tumor. 
one of the best I have ever done because this was very early in my career as a consultant when I went to Vatican. Large tumor, large tumor. This is the patient post op. We, we don't have these cranial nerve, we don't have the special nerve monitors in our centers. So I did this with the suboccipital approach rather than the retromastoid approach because I was used to this approach better than retromastoid approach. And I thought the tumor was a bit bigger. So that's why I used this. And here he is. No facial nerve palsy and complete resection. So that was a big achievement for me in my life as a you know young neurosurgeon. Another CP angle which I recently did, uh, left sided. The the problem here, you know, as I as I told you earlier, the microscope is not very maneuverable. I mean, you, I, it's, it's difficult to handle. So left sided tumors. That I I mean, we had problems. I will show you later why it happens. Because this was the first uh, CP angle tumor I did I, soon as I went to Ratnapura. So I was, you know, just learning. I was on my learning curve regarding the, you know, the, uh, the, the tech, I mean, regarding the ergonomics and regarding the, you know, the positioning and uh, regarding the microscope also, I was not very familiar. So we positioned her uh, park bench position, uh, lateral position for a retromastoid craniotomy. And uh, I did the retromastoid craniotomy and uh, uh, tried to open up the CSF system, the CV angle system. But I, I found that the cerebellum was very tense and it was coming out severely edematous and it couldn't do anything. Then I realized, I mean, if you still go ahead with the procedure, so you will end up in dimension B, the vital structures, you will end up in taking her cerebellum out. So I, what I did, I did not harm the patient. I realized, understood the situation. I abandoned the procedure. I closed the uh, posterior fossa uh, incision and I inserted the VP shunt on the right side. And I walk her up, I explain to her, see, this is what happened. Uh, we have technical difficulties in operating your tumor here. So I will send you to somewhere else where you have, I mean, uh, proper facilities. And then I readmitted her to my unit. But unfortunately, by that time, the second wave of COVID has hit Colombo. So difficult for me to go there or difficult for me to, you know, to send this patient there. And she was also happy to undergo the operation uh, at Ratnapura. And by that time I had done another two CP angle tumors on the left side. So I found out the way. I found out what you should do. Uh, and I was able to resect the tumor completely. And here, he, here she is, no facial nerve palsy, absolutely fine. This, this was another uh, CP angle tumor I did before the previous case. Again, a left-sided tumor. So by that time, I have found the way. I have found the techniques of uh, using the microscope and handling it. So this is the pre-op, uh, again, MRI was not available, not, 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 it's not because it's not available. She did not want to go out. That's the problem with these people, even, you know, how much you try to convince them, disease, you know, the problem with them. Sometimes they don't understand, sometimes they don't listen to you. So this is the post -op. Uh Preoperatively, uh, she didn't have hydrocephalus, you know, early hydrocephalus, but she given up the hydrocephalus, so I had to insert a VP shunt for her also. She unfortunately got a facial nerve palsy, uh, but otherwise she was okay. She was having swallowing difficulties also, but it's a little bit time. Okay, let's get into some uh, difficult pediatric cases. This is uh, six months old baby 
with a large cerebral abscess and she, he was having a congenital heart defect also. So the abscess was aspirated in some other center and sent to her local hospital, which was closer to Batiklo. And since the fever was not settling, they referred back to us. And this is the uh, abscess before aspiration, and this is after aspiration, so it has grown in size. And the child was having congenital heart defects also. There was some anesthetic issues as well. But the anesthetists were very good. We were able to uh, give the child anesthesia and we were able to operate on her. So I excised the abscess completely because this is a large abscess. I thought of excising it and I excised it. And you see the fever chart before the surgery, high fever and this is the day we operated, he was put to he, uh, the child was sent to a ICU, no fever. Immediately, you see, there is no fever. Right, so I'll show you the video. I think I'm having that. This is the child moving all the four limbs and active without any fever. Okay. And, uh, right. I'll show you some of the neurovascular cases because I told you I'm very fond of this neurovascular territory. First case, 49 year old male, previously healthy and had a sudden collapse around 7 p.m. where we found, where we saw him at the ETU with the GCS of 11, which was dropped within three, four hours to seven. So we had to tube him and Unfortunately, that day, CT machine was out of order. That's why I'm showing you this, this case. And we were ventilating him, paralyzing. And the midnight, his left vehicle started to become unreactive. So we operated next morning. I had no other option. No CT, no CT angiogram. Therefore, no CT angiogram. Young patient, sudden collapse. So we obviously uh, anticipate some neurovascular scenario here. So we were ready with aneurysm clips and you know, depending on the available facilities, we were ready. This is the post-op CT, you see. He was a translator and the problem I had, he's a translator. So there's a high chance that I would further compromise his language area, eloquent area. So I was very careful. This is the post of CT, and uh, it was a cavernoma, macroscopically, cavernoma. And this is him. This is post op day five. This is him last week when I saw him in the wards. He was slightly. Uh, he was initially aphasic, but he was he's having a remarkable recovery. He can understand and he can speak a few words. I'm sure he will come out with good results. Right, another one. 12 years old girl with a left parietal ICH. Initial GCS 14, dropped to 12. We did the CT angiogram. Spetzler Martin grade three. AV malformation we have found. So you see the uh, clot here, again, eloquent area. So have to be careful. This is what all you get. So this is our CT angel. I saw this in the console, but I mean, you can't expect more from a 16 slice CT scanner. And my, you know, my radiology colleagues are fantastic. We have three radiologists at Rathnapura, fantastic guys. This is the intraoperative picture of the brain, it's very tight. This is following the resection of the AVM. This is the post-op CT, just for the comparison. This is pre op this is post-op. This is the post-op again. This is the video of her.
This is post of day three. We, she was remarkably doing well after post op. She initially had some, you know, uh, deficits with her short term memory, but I saw her in the clinic. She has almost 90% recovered, and I'm sure she will recover fully with time. Satisfying surgery again. So we see lots of lots of intracerebral hemorrhages. And I was in particular in the Eastern province, and still in Rastapur also I'm seeing so many various types of intracerebral hemorrhage. This patient was on warfarin, presented with a GCS of three, and that's why I'm showing to you. So what I used to do, we don't have the endoscope. So what I used to do is wear hall for a mini craniectomy and the evacuation of the clot. This is the pre-op, this is the post-op you see. I'm showing this to you because she presented with a GCS of three. And this is after two weeks. This is after two weeks. So a good result, a very good result. Right, another ICH, the same thing I did. Patient went home, GCS 15 without any deficit. Another one. You see the Burr Hall evacuation, patient went home. And this is some, you know, some of the measures of the uh, CT angiograms we had at Batiklo. This is, this is all what you get. You don't get, you know, these sophisticated hi-fi images, right? You don't see floor, you don't see this uh, ICG. And uh, you see, this film only before the surgery. So you have this film, you get a mental image. I don't know whether you can see the aneurysm. You see the anterior communicating artery aneurysm here. Here also you can see anterior communicating artery aneurysm here. That's all you have got. So you go ahead. We clip this uh, with, I mean, this is only a few of the cases. This patient obviously a young one, but uh, he, he developed a myocardial infarction and the post of day three and he passed away. Otherwise, uh, post, his post of CT was fine, but I couldn't find the post of CT in my, you know, in my phone. Uh, right, this is another scenario. This is recently, it happened. 44 years old female, hypertensive with defaulted treatment. SH presented with a GCS of three and it was a large peak of aneurysm, 1.9 centimeters. Bedside echo we did, Egyptian fraction was 35%. So the question for me, operate or not, Egyptian fraction 35, GCS of three, but 44 years of age. And anesthetists were asking me, are you really going to operate on this patient? I said, yes, because she's still young. So let's give her a chance and see. And I don't have, unfortunately, a post of CT for her. Uh, there is she. So she had zero power on the left side initially. So now she's gradually improving. We did tracheostomy for her. She's still on, you know, still improving. We did another. 2 DFO following the surgery and ejection fraction came as 50. So I'm happy that I operated on her. Okay. Few spine cases for you. We did a lot of spine cases, but these are only few of them, which are important to the topic. 12 years old boy, previous to my session one year back, Presented with left lower limb weakness with the three by three out of five power, agent type two uh, neurofibroma, <clears throat> uh, yeah, dumbbell tumor. I don't know whether you can see the tumor here. So this is the tumor at T10, T11 levels. This is the tumor, big one, a dumbbell tumor. 
and we did the surgery <clears throat> with the postrolateral approach with left-sided costal transversectomy and this is how we did he couldn't walk before <clears throat> and this is immediately after surgery moving with difficulty <clears throat> Very poor people even did not have money to come to the uh, hospital. She told me that uh, <clears throat> they need 50 rupees. 50 rupees is one quarter of a dollar to come to the hospital and go back. But I mean, they were so poor that they were unable to find 50 rupees to come to the hospital. So I kept him quite a few days. So this is post of day two. This is after one week. This is after one week. Getting better. Still a bit unstable, but getting better. Right. This is after two weeks. I kept him in the ward. See? See the improvement. So we kept him for three weeks and gave them physiotherapy. Right. Okay. <clears throat> Another one. Interesting case. This patient with neurofibromatosis type 2 presented with bilateral lower limb power one out of five for one year and bilateral upper limb power of three out of five for the last six months. They were from the Eastern province. They were from Ampara or Bahawaya, which is in the Eastern province. And uh, I have seen them when I was in Batiklo. And since I shifted to Ratnapura, they contacted me and they came all the way to Ratnapura to get the surgery done. So she had this uh, bilateral schonomas, probably. And if you see the cervical spine, you see a cervical spine tumor here, two, three, four, five, six, seven, yes, six, seven level C-spine tumor. Here, you see the C-spine tumor there, and you see another uh, thoracolumba, uh, yeah, L1 tumor there, and you see another, where is it? Another tumor here. You can see the uh, the quality of the images are not that great anyway. So she presented with these three spinal tumors, cervical, thoracic, and lumbar, and uh, two uh, brain tumors. So what we did, we did the, uh, first I did the uh, thoracic and the, the lumbar uh, uh, tumors at one go. It came as meningotheliomatous meningioma. And then I did the uh, cervical spine after some time. It came as a schonoma. And her power was zero in the upper. Her power was around three by five. As I mentioned, uh, pre-op, this is her last week at the clinic. Five out of five power in the upper limbs. Still the power is around two out of five in the right leg. And the left leg is around one out of five. Okay, and she's awaiting the uh, the post-operative MRI as well as uh, I'm thinking of doing the uh, the posterior facet tumor as well. It's a good case. I think we can uh, talk about this later on a different day. Another case: 51-year-old male with the previous surgery done. Again, he had a recurrence of tumor. Uh, I forgot to tell you, this, this patient, there was a delay from the patient's point of view to present to the hospital of one year because they had done native treatment. Very unfortunate. 20 years old female ending up in the wheelchair. Yeah, so this case, 51-year-old male had previous surgery for the cervical spine tumor. 
and had recurrence of tumor and presented to us with a bilateral upper limb power of two and lower limb power of one. He had very poor family support and again he also had gone for native treatment and he presented with an Eden type 2 C uh, dumbbell tumor. So what we did, you can see the tumor, dumbbell tumor, two type 2 C. So the vertebral artery was uh, adherent to the tumor. And uh, what we did, we did, uh, we went uh, through the posterior approach and I removed the 100% of the intraspinal component and I could only remove 80% of the extraspinal component. And you see the video here. This is him. Bit of improvement. On the left side, he had a power zero in the lower limbs. Improved. This is five days after the surgery. So, significant improvement on the left side. A bit of improvement on the right side. Okay. Another one. Another one. Patient with no family support at all. Patient is all alone. She's living alone and she has no proper place to stay. Present to us, presented to us recently with lower limb weakness of three out of five and started deteriorating and her power was one out of five when we sent her for an MRI to Colombo. And she came back to us with the zero power preoperatively. Unfortunately, the MRI machine went out of order when the MRI was, you know, in the process. So we did not have films, so we had only the report. The report says there is a deep lesion. So what am I going to do? Am I going to send her back for an MRI, another MRI? No, I had to operate on her because she was deteriorating rapidly. So the first time I operated without a film, defoliation. So this is what happened. Zero power before the surgery and Okay, right. Few pediatric cases for you to show. This is when I practiced in particular the Eastern province. You see so many types of hydrocephalus. You name it, we have it. Holoprosencephaly, hydrodencephaly, right? Each and every time, hydrocephalus. Lots of neural tube defects. See, this is only maybe 10% of our work. We done so many. Okay, that's all about the cases. Right, so this was a glimpse of our work. So now I'm showing you, this is the microscope I'm using at the moment. The basic microscope you can see, but this is how we overcome. So th th this is what we have done so far with this. We don't have a separate covering for microscope. This is how we cover it. Okay, this is the theater setup in uh, Ratnapura. This is where I'm currently working at. This is the neurosurgical theater. Now you can see we have the illuminator. We put the CT there and we just take a photo. We don't have this computerized system where you can access the packs then you can access your images through the pack system so we don't have that system here and this is the previous station this is batiklo so you see the screen there so it was a much better microscope much better facilities you can see okay one more case to show you the difficulties we are facing every day as neurosurgeons this case 
uh, gift for me on 31st December. Patient presented with SH, GCS of 3, and we found this large aneurysm, this supraclinal aneurysm, and the CT angio. This is the aneurysm, so you can see my radiology colleagues did the great, great work to provide me this, uh, this thing. So what happened, unfortunately, and uh, we dissected and the severe brain edema was there. And uh, I saw just a glimpse of the, uh, the dome uh, under the clinoid process. I was about to drill the clinoid, but unfortunately the microscope stopped functioning. It was not focusing anymore. So what should I do? Should I proceed? Large aneurysm? Drilling the clinoid without a microscope? No. I said it was not safe. What I did, I did the decompression. I did uh, remove the CSF so the brain was relaxed. I wrapped the aneurysm, I, the, the, the fundus which I could see through my opening, and I abandoned the procedure and came back. I cannot transfer at the moment for coiling or any other because she's not stable. She presented the GCS of three. So she's being still ventilated. I explained to the patients, the relatives, the procedure. So these are the, you know, the difficulties we encounter, right? Just to show you, right? So see, they were trying to fix the microscope. They thought it, you know, because of the, uh, the, the covering they use, it was not functioning with the aneurysm clips. So see, that's the facilities we have. Just one clip applicator, just one clip remover. Okay, here the patient. They, they didn't know that I was recording. Okay. Okay, that's the situation here. This is my team, right? Uh, they haven't had much neurosurgical practice. Now, this is my released house officer. This is my MO. They were doing a VP shunt together under my supervision. So now they are happy because uh, satisfying with their work. Here they're doing an acute SDH. They were just doing chronic hall evacuation of chronic SDH. But now they are, I think they're enjoying, this is my neurosurgical unit, female, female uh, the ward. I'm having three beds at the moment. This is the male unit. This is on 31st of December, so we have discharged most of the patients. Five beds are there. This is my ward team. So the take home messages, especially to the juniors, when you work in, you know, uh, away from the center where your facilities, facilities are centered at, First thing I would advise, do no harm to patient, whatever the instance, right? Because you're bound to do that. Whatever the protocol or policy, that's number one. So if your protocol threatens the life of your patient, then what's the point of following the protocol? So at any instance, do not harm the patient. Understanding human nature, right? Understanding what life is, right? Listen to the others. And be sympathetic always. Understand the patient's feelings, you know, their priorities, attitudes, concepts that is especially important when you work, you know, in a rural area, right? You know the patient's beliefs, misbeliefs are there, misconceptions are there. Sometimes you had to, you know, you had to work hard more on it rather than your surgery to change them, right? Humans are humans everywhere, we know that. So always treat patients like your mother, like your father, like your relative, always think. If it happens to your relative, your family member, how are you going to manage that? That's the most important thing. Understand the circumstances. You have to be flexible, right? You should not have a strict policy. For example, I'll give you a case scenario. Where if a child comes to you with a large ICH and low GCS and uh, she deteriorates in front of you and uh, imagine that the pupils start becoming non-reactive, you highly suspect an AVM in this case, right? A young child with an ICH and uh, 
see that you don't have access to CT angiogram or the CT machine is out of order, what would you do? If, if you ask that question from me, what I would do, I would explain the relatives, the parents, the condition. This is the situation. See, the child can die during transfer, right? There is no such system in our country that, that the neurosurgical patient is directly going to a neurosurgical theater in a different center. So obviously there will be delays, right? So we probably pr properly communicate that you're going to do the surgery to save the child. So communication is of utmost importance. At the same time, you should have, you know, an insight to what you are capable of. You should, you, I mean, you should know whether you are able to, you are capable of doing this, right? You know, have you done AVMs before, right? If so, do you know how to get rid of the mess when things go wrong? You know, things can go wrong. People might point fingers at you. Why didn't you do this? Why did you do this? And why didn't you do this? You know, it's very easy to, you know, talk, very, very easy to tell. Words are very easy, but you know, doing it is very difficult. Right? Finding faults are very easy, but you know, doing something is very difficult. Right? You know, there is a learning curve for any surgery. For neurocomplex neurosurgical cases, it's much, much longer. That's why you need experience. So if you are confident and you know how to get rid of the mess, provided you have the basic facilities at least, I think you should proceed. You should go ahead and do the surgery. You should not be overconfident. Confident, but not overconfident. If you are overconfident, you will kill both your patient and yourself, right? And you should try to get the maximum out of what is available to you rather than pointing fingers, rather than saying, oh, I don't have this, I don't have that, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do that, right? This is how the protocols are, this is how the guidelines are, this is what you should do, but try to get the maximum out of what is available. That's what I'm doing. Right. So respect your seniors. You need experience. You know it takes you know time to get the experience. That's why you need guidance from your seniors, right? And that's why you you know you respect skilled and excel surgeons, right? Some people are well skilled. Some people are less skilled. Some people are fast learners. You know some people are slow learners, right? So I need to you know give uh, and not. At last, but not least, enjoy life. You can enjoy your life in the periphery. Right, so, I mean, quick word regarding uh, my colleagues, neurosurgical colleagues. When you talk about neurosurgical practice in Sri Lanka, you can't forget them. It's not just me, it's, uh, you know, it's a, uh, it's a group. So all the 25 neurosurgeons are working in Sri Lanka, fantastic, skilled neurosurgeons. All of them doing a tremendous service to their country, right? All neurosurgeons at National Hospital Colombo doing a great job. My boss, uh, you know, my mentor, Dr. Kularatna, I should be very extremely thankful to him. He's the one who identified my skill and gave me free hand. So by the end of my, you know, senior, as a senior, by my local training as a senior resident, I had done more than 40 aneurysms. You know, people, when I went to UK, I told this, people say, people were thinking that I'm lying because, you know, 40, 44 aneurysms in two years is a very, you know, a huge amount. If I'm in a position today, it's because of them, right? So I'm very grateful to them. And uh, I should mention Dr. Deepa Latanayak, who is the president of the Neurosurgical Association. He's very keen to on improving the standards in our country. And Dr. Sunil Pereira, who is, uh, you know, a very popular character and uh, considered the best neurosurgeon in Sri Lanka, has done an unforgettable service to the country. So wherever they are, they're, they're in Andhra wherever they are, they are providing a huge service to the country. It, for example, if it was not, you know, for the previous neurosurgeon who worked at Bhattapura, who got this microscope for a donation, I, want, I wouldn't have, you know, uh, I wouldn't have, uh, uh, you know, done this presentation. I mean, the most of the presentation without a microscope. So I'm very grateful to them. Right. So you know, the life is not very easy. It's difficult, right? It's difficult. It's very unsure, right? I'll just tell you one story, and I end my 
talk, right? I think I haven't told this before to anyone. Uh, when I was in UK, when I first went to UK, uh, I was in, uh, uh, I went to King's College London. I didn't have the uh, hospital accommodation. So I was uh, staying in a very small room in a small hotel. The first day I slipped in the bathroom. I hit my head on the edge of the bathtub. I don't know whether I was unconscious for a few minutes or not, right? So I didn't know what happened. Then I woke up and uh, I feel a little bit of headache. And uh, I said I was completely okay. Uh, but I persistently had this headache for a few, few, you know, few weeks. Uh, but, you know, I was uh, just starting my overseas training. So I was very reluctant to tell them and to get a CT scan or an MRI done. So I said, okay. I think I'm fine. But you know what happened? After some time, I realized that I was losing, you know, some of my uh, long time memory, right? For example, I can still remember this, you know, uh, every day we have this MDT meeting uh, uh, for the residents. So there are the neurosurgeons coming and the residents coming and they're presenting the cases. So one day, they ask questions from the residents. They ask from me, tell me the uh, causes of hydrocephalus, the basic medical student question. Right? So I had done, you would have seen, I had done research on hydrocephalus. So I had read lots of books, Schmeidick and Sweet, Yeomans, Rengachari, everything. I could tell from A to A to E regarding hydrocephalus, but you know, I couldn't answer that question. I was saying, I was blabbering, I was saying increased production, uh, reduced absorption, you know. I was shocked and people were shocked. People were laughing at the back of me. Uh, it's a choice. So I was a senior fellow. I went as a senior fellow, but uh, I couldn't answer that question. So I had that intermittent loss of memory. So I was really frustrated. I couldn't tell the but I, I couldn't tell that to anyone. So I was really, really frustrated. I went back to the room. Then I started from A to Z. I said, I thought, oh my goodness, my neurosurgical career is over now. That's what I thought. Then after one and a half months, I came back to Sri Lanka and I did CT, I did MRI, it was normal, but I had the problem until eight months. So, you know, it was terrible. It was horrible experience I had initially because I had King's College Hospital is, you know, a terrible place Terrible, I mean, very busy, extremely busy. It's one of the best centers in UK. I know that it's very, very difficult, you know, when you especially start with coming from a different country and when you get personal problems like this and on top of that, you hit your head and you lose your memory sometimes, it's very difficult. So, but you know, I, I, I was able to get rid of that problem. I, after eight months, I was on my own, back to normal. Right, uh, but you know, I'm quite sure that people, you know, must have laughed at their backs. It doesn't matter, right? Uh, uh, then I realized uh, I need to move on. So I, after 15 months of training there, then I, uh, I mean, I applied for uh, UCLS, the Queen's Square Hospital, and I was lucky enough to go there. And things changed. That was the turning point in my life, neurosurgical career. Then I had to compensate for the things I lost. So I went to so many, you know, so many countries, so many, I met so many people, I met, did so many researches within, you know, you would have seen in a short period of time. And I was uh, completely okay. And uh, they helped me very well. They believed in my abilities. The people at Queen Square, I'm very, very grateful to them. And uh, fantastic time I had. Uh, I just told that because, you know, sometimes the, my colleagues at King's College, they'll be wondering, hey, see, that, that man is appearing on YouTube now, he's doing international webinars, how come? Probably he might have stolen some of the other people's cases and presenting it. <laughs> so, right, so that's life. So, you know, it's very hard. And uh, now I'm back to my own. And... Uh, so what I need to do, I need to provide the better service to the country. That's it. So that's how we do. So, right. I think that's the end of my talk, John.
Okay, great, great. Uh, in many aspects, uh, from the tourism part for me, and, and uh, the rest of the issues you talked about. But let me turn this over. The neurosurgical aspect of it was very interesting. I'll let the irrepressible Warlicks lead that neurosurgical discussion. Hey, Warlicks. Yeah, thank you for your uh, talk. It's so like inspire, inspiring, like young neurosurgeons like me. And I think that is good for uh, the neurosurgical residents from all over. Uh, many countries too. Mm -hmm. So it's time for the discussions and questions or even like uh, suggestions uh, to the floors. If anyone have questions, you can ask Dr. Surat about this. I think Eamon has a question. Eamon, do you have a question there? Are you raising a hand? Go ahead, Eamon. Uh, we can't hear you, Eamon. Yeah. I think you, you need yes, to unmute. Yes. Can, can you hear me now? That's better. That's better. Yeah, yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you, John, for this lecture. Thank you so much. And thank you for the doctor because he is inspiring and he's doing a great uh, job. But my question, how, how he is doing, I mean, um, how is the, the, the tumor resection or removal without doing MRI before, uh, I mean, before the operation? How he can uh, uh, recognize the cleavage plane if there is any um, encasing uh, pieces or uh, or uh, important structure, uh, I, I hope you can answer this question and answer because I, I think it is an important to do MRI before the, the the resection or the operation of tumor resection. Thank you. I agree with you. Yes, Naiman, I completely agree with you. That's the challenge in this part of the country. So that's the problem. So that's why I was, you know, I was selecting these cases, and uh, we have done, you know, so much cases routine cases with MRI, I mean, which I have not discussed here. So I have just discussed this. Mm -hmm. uh, the few cases which I have done without, you know, having an MRI, which is really difficult. I, I, I agree with you. So that's why I said uh, you have to anticipate. That depends on, you know, your experience, what you have seen, what you have done before as well. So as a resident, I have done, I mean, so many meningiomas and so many gliomas. So, uh, uh, so I anticipate uh, these are the problems that we would encounter and you have to be, uh, uh, you, you, you should be anticipating this and you have to get ready for this, right? So uh, in that situation to answer your question, it's a difficult thing. So it's a intraoperative, uh, it's your intraoperative decision that will depend on uh, how you, you know, how you have gathered things together during your neurosurgical life, neurosurgical career. Sometimes things might go wrong. Sometimes things might succeed. So fortunately for me, I succeeded, but uh, everyone might not succeed. That's why the communication is very important. Before the surgery, you had to discuss with the relatives. So this is what you got. This is, this is what we anticipate. This is what could happen. You go without this. Obviously people have operated without MRIs with the, uh, before the invention of the MRI. Uh, but you know, as I said earlier, this is 2021, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So if something goes wrong, people will point fingers at you. Say, hey, man, that that man is doing without an MRI. So if something goes wrong, how are you going to justify? That is dangerous neurosurgery. Someone will point fingers at you. Absolutely right. That's what I'm talking about. So some. That's why I'm always telling you, you have to be circumstantial. You have to you have to be flexible, right? You do should not have a strict policy. If I were Right, you say, for example, that those cases, if I were to uh, send those patients back, telling, no, I can't do this surgery, you, you go to somewhere else, right? I would have missed that. There were certain instances that we missed the patient's lives, right? We asked them to go for MRI, they, didn't, they never went there, they presented with the GCS of free and they died. I had bad experiences. So that's why I always try to think of from the patient's point of view, patient's aspect, right? So it may not be the best for you, but it may be the best for the patient. Thank you, thank you. Clear, thank you. Confident, not overconfident. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Takashi, you, ha you have anything to say, Takashi? 
Yeah, uh, thank you for a great lecture. So a very informative lecture. And uh, I appreciate, um, uh, though, even though the limited circumstances, you did very well. Uh, and very, uh, thank you for the patients. I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, I would ask about the glioma patients. Um, so you removed the glioma, then after surgery, uh, you uh, the patient went on the radiation. So uh, uh, in, in, in Sri Lanka, so chemotherapy, 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 such as chemotherapy, and bevacizumab or some other chemotherapy is available. It's available. It's available. We refer the patients to the oncologist, so oncologist. they take over the patient and they okay. they, they do the chemotherapy and radiotherapy and everything is there. So in Sri Lanka, also you refer the oncologist for chemotherapy. Yes, that's true. We refer okay. to the oncologist. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah, great. you did a great job. So um, thank I you very expect the future success. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Warlocks, keep it rolling. Are you there, Warlocks? Warlocks, you're taking a nap. <laughs> Just waiting for uh, other like comments or like the questions from the panelists. You were eating, weren't you? <laughs> no, no. Oh, no. Okay, okay. <laughs> I thought I caught you. No, can, I have, but, can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah. yeah of course, can of I, course. Go ahead. Can I ask Go ahead. From Varalex. So she's from Thailand. So how is the neurosurgical practice in Thailand? How is the technology wise like? Oh, we have uh, uh, like in the medical school, we have uh, all everything, like even the robot. So I just finished my trainings like neurovascular and endovascular. So I like, have like uh, can do both of things now. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, so uh, like for it's a challenge things, and uh, I think it's a uh, in Thailand we have a lot of things. Yeah. Okay, that's great. So, uh, what is your you know what is your uh, conception uh, regarding uh, doing surgeries? You know, without proper angiograms, without proper MRIs. What do you think? Um, if it for happens to you, what would you do? Um, like if I have a limitation, actually I'm talking about like my uh, own experience then because uh, after my trainings, I have to move back to work at the smaller hospital in which we do not really have an MRI uh, available. So it's depend like on me if, I mean, if I consider that, uh, that so as, as what you say that uh, it has to be selected sometimes like if that case, I consider that there's no need to do the MRI in which there's no need for that, like no uh, dangerous neurovascular structure. So sometimes it takes too much time to do the MRI. Maybe I prefer to do the MRI like for the follow up, like post operative. But for sometimes, like especially uh, on the recent case, of course, that sometimes like CTA it's uh, very necessary. But uh, like. Right now, I think that CTA reconstruction with bone is also like helpful too. Uh, some uh, like in my center that I just got a train, they hardly do the angiogram, but they prefer to do the CTA with the bone reconstructions, and which is also like helpful. You just like uh, have to improve the quality of the CTA, so it also can replace the uh, invasive angiograms too. Yeah, but. Yeah, but even like for for me, I'm I'm talking like even your country do not have a, a DSA. I mean, digital subtraction angle. Yeah, we, 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 we do have DSA. We do have DSA. We do have DSA in Colombo. We do have DSA in Kandy. We do have DSA. In, you know, in three or four places. Wow. So if the CT angle is negative, we send definitely for the DSA. We yeah, follow yeah. the protocols, but you, uh, but what I mean is, you know, when it comes to you know some circumstances which are unavoidable. Yeah. Then you have to take yeah. In my in my countries, uh, the uh even the endovascular treatment is still like a problem too because uh about the financial problem. So of course I you know so we still have to like based on the micro surgery we still like need to practice the bypass creeping reconstructions or proximal control instead of using the balloons. In which okay I I trained to use the balloon but of course like. Once that we, we have to select the case because one balloon that maybe 
it can cost more than like one surgical case. So yeah, in the That's like cool. developing countries like mine, yeah. even how like, okay, I go train in Japan, a lot of high technologies, but when you back to your country, like you still have to base like, you know, the real world, as, as you say, like between CTM and Thank you. Thank you for your thoughts. Okay. Anybody else have any comments or questions or just like to meet uh, Sarath, uh, Vorlix, and uh, Takashi? If not, uh, we'll wrap it up. Any closing remarks, Vorlix? Oh, oh, you know, we have, you know, we have a, a webcast tomorrow. Let, let me uh, get that together, Vorlix, while you, uh, you say your parting words, okay? Warlix, well, okay. Let me let me get this up on the screen, okay? About the uh, webcast tomorrow. <clears throat> you know, it's it's from a place much like yours, Sarat. Uh, uh, very rural. Uh, it's called Reunion Island, off the coast of Africa. Uh, oh no, I'm sorry. It's in the Seychelles, which I'm sure. It's a beautiful group of islands. You know what Seychelles is, right, uh, uh, Sarath? Yeah. No, of course. Yeah, it's it's, it's kind of area in your area of the world, actually. Uh, so yeah, so it's a neuro, neuro uh, anatomy lecture on tentorial and cerebral, and there's also going to be a um, Kahoot quiz. Uh, what do you think about that, Warlix? Are you excited about that, having the, the Kahoot quiz? Yes. <laughs> if, <laughs> if Aren't I you excited? Have... I mean, you, 10 questions, and, and you, and you got to answer them live. And you get, and yeah. you get that. <laughs> yeah, but the medical, like, what the neurosurgical residents always get higher score than me, so I'm not going to show up. <laughs> Yeah, we'll have, we'll have to get prizes and everything. But I mean, the good the, the, yeah. neuros, the neurosurgeon makes up the questions from the from the lecture, so it's relevant. And eventually, I guess, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to put the, the information for uh, Pragnesh just said he's interested. And uh, let me put the information up there. Uh, well, okay, we'll we'll, we'll, wrap, we'll wrap it up, I guess, Warlick. So. Uh, does anybody else want to just, I tell you, let me just some parting words. The role of this Zoom neurosurgery conferences is, you know, we're, we're yet to establish its place, but I think it's a very good time to network with people within the neurosurgical community after the presentation. Uh, and Sarath will be here for a minute or two, Warlix, me, uh, there's a couple of other, we'll just mix and we'll be off camera, okay? So, what do you think, Warlocks? That's a good idea, huh, Warlocks? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. <laughs> just say yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, very, yeah. very good, Sarah. Thank you very much. Thank and we, you look very much John. we look, we look course, forward too. to having more with you. Of course, yes. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, and, and, and thank hang around, everybody. everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. See you tomorrow.